Uh, now, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's good to be with you guys again for church service. I think it's been about maybe four, is it four months since we've done like online church? So that's a third of the year, if my math serves me correctly. It's a crazy amount of time to do online church. Uh, I don't know how you guys are going, but uh, yeah, sort of like this kind of slow ease uh, into sort of a normal life of doing online church. But hopefully we get to meet uh, in person sometime soon again. Uh, we definitely look forward to that. But I've always been encouraged to see all of us um, come together uh, online for church. That's always been encouraging that we can do that. And let's keep doing that as well as we open up God's word together. So if you do have your Bible, uh, keep it open at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Uh, it's very short, but there's a lot of great stuff uh, in this passage today. So how about I pray for us one more time before we get into God's word? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much that we have this wonderful opportunity. What a blessing to come together and meet together. Uh, Father, we pray that we might uh, sit under the authority of your word. Uh, Lord, we realize that there are so many uh, thoughts and opinions and suggestions swirling out in the world that tempt us to follow them. But God, as believers in Christ Jesus, uh, we believe in your word. Uh, we want to be shaped and molded by it, uh, changed and conformed to be more like Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when, I, when I used to live on the SNBC campus, uh, every morning without fail at 10.45, we have morning tea. Uh, so it's where classes stop for a little bit and everyone comes into the, the sort of the courtyard area, grab some food and just have a chat with some friends. So one particular day I was chatting with a bunch of guys and we were, you know, joking and laughing and mucking around about something stupid as guys usually do. But the very next moment, our uh, college principal, Stuart Colton, walks over and he joins our conversation. Suddenly everything got quiet. Uh, all the stuff that we were joking about and laughing about didn't seem an appropriate thing to do when the principal's there. So all of a sudden, all the guys went on their best behavior, stood up straight, and we changed our conversation to talk about things like church and theology and the Bible, just so that that would be the more appropriate thing to do when the college principal was there. So I don't know if you guys uh, maybe have that experience before, but you know when you're, when you're with your mates, you, know, you conduct yourself a certain way, right? Uh, you tease each other, you call each other names, you clown around. But when the principal comes around, you're not quite the same, are you? Now, I'd imagine that the way you talk and act with your closest friends is probably not how you would talk and act with your parents. And so the point I'm making here is not that Stuart Colton is a killjoy. If any of you ever meet Stuart, please don't tell him I said that. Uh, he's not a killjoy. He's a rather fantastic man. But rather, the point I'm making is that being with particular people shapes and changes how you behave. And really, this is Paul's point in chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Now, if you can cast your mind back just to last week, you might remember that uh, Paul was urging the Colossians not to follow those false teachers who were promising them that if they kept all the religious practices, they could have a deeper and fuller relationship with God. But Paul says not only is that a lie, it's empty and it offers you no value. And so Paul re-emphasizes their union with Christ, who is the head of the church. And Paul says that only by remaining in Christ can they be nourished and grow with the growth that is from God. And so now today, in chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, Paul kind of takes that idea and he, he leans into it even more by emphasizing once again our relationship with Jesus. And so today, Paul's point is rather simple. His point is being with Jesus shapes and changes how we live. Being with Jesus shapes and changes how we live. Now, I love this part of the Bible here in Colossians because Paul brilliantly sets up this main point by first drawing out the fact that the Colossians have a new position with Christ. And he says that this new position is grounded in Jesus's gospel journey. So if you have your Bible with you, keep it open. I want to just point you to a couple of verses and see if you can follow with me and follow with Paul and see what he's trying to get at. Now, last week, if you look at chapter 2, verse 20, chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, with Christ, you died. Okay, now, last week, we saw how they no longer have to submit to all those 
religious practices and all those law regulations that used to enslave them. Having been set free from that, they have no reason and no benefit to go back to the old way of life. Now today, look at chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, you have been raised with Christ and you are with Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. In chapter 3, verse 3, he says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then in chapter 3, verse 4, he says, they will appear with Christ in glory. I wonder here, did you capture the, the point that Paul made? Did you see the, the connection, the flow here? Do you see what their new position is? Paul says that the, the Colossians' new position is that they are now with Christ. By faith alone, they are with Christ in his death, with Christ in his resurrection, with Christ in his ascension, and with Christ in his second coming. The Colossians are bound forever with Christ at each of these stages. That's what Paul wants you and I to know. So how about we unpack these one by one today? Let's look at the first one that Paul says in verse 1. Uh, they are raised with Christ. Now, uh, if you guys remember last week, chapter 2, verse 16 to 23, uh, we saw how the false teachers were promising the Colossians that uh, they could be lifted up into the heavenly realms with all the angels and have these heightened spiritual experiences of worship. And so it's clear that the Colossians were being tempted to seek the things above. But here, ironically, Paul begins chapter 3 by essentially telling the Colossians that there is something above that is worth seeking. But it's not angels, and it's not an experience. In verse 1, Paul says, They have been raised with Christ in his resurrection, and therefore should seek the things that are above. And so as you look at verse 1, what is the thing that is above that they should be seeking? Well, it's none other than Christ Jesus, isn't it? Now, I don't know if you've had, ever had this happen to you, but um, have you ever kind of looked around your house for your keys or your phone? Uh, maybe you lost it, uh, you misplaced it, you don't know where you last saw it. And so you, you, you're flipping couch cushions and you're rummaging through your table, but you can't find anything, only to realize that they were in your pocket the whole time. It happens to me more than I like to admit, but it's so frustrating when it happens, isn't it? I mean, what a waste of effort and time looking for something only to realize I had it all along. See, the false teachers were inviting the Colossians to this elevated, heightened worship experience with the angels in heaven. But Paul says, if you really do want that, it's actually already yours in Christ who is above. They don't need to waste their effort and time looking for something that they've had all along. They don't need to keep these religious practices. You don't need to beat up your body into submission. By faith, they are with Christ and they already belong to the world above where Christ is. And therefore, uh, Paul is not instructing the Colossians not to seek the things above. Rather, he's instructing them to seek the right thing in the right way. That is to seek Christ alone by faith alone. But not only are they raised with Christ, uh, they are also seated with Christ at the right hand of God. Now, I think we, we maybe say this statement a lot, but you need to understand this is a huge, a massive statement for Paul to make. And that is because in Jewish tradition and in Jewish thought, uh, it is understood that God alone sits on the throne in heaven and he sits as the sovereign ruler over all things and he's surrounded by the angels. That's the picture in Jewish thought. But here in verse 1, what does Paul say? Paul says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That means that Jesus shares in God's sovereign rule over all creation, over all things. Uh, this image is actually traced all the way back in Psalm 110 verse 1, which says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So, so the image of Jesus seated at the right hand of God is actually the image of Jesus' victory over all the principalities and powers and elemental spirits of the world. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but um, 
in the British royal family photo, uh, it's usually or most likely the queen who's um, often sit seated. And when she sits, it's a symbol of her power, of her authority and of her rule. But the people who are with her are her family and her family share in the blessing of her reign. And so because of her, they have special privileges, honors and protection because they are united with her. And so Paul says that by faith, all believers are with Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. Okay, so what does that mean for you and me? It actually means a lot of things, but for today, let me just share with you three things that it means for you and me to be with Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. Three things. Uh, first thing it means is that because Jesus sits as the sovereign ruler over all things, then the Colossians should worship him and him alone. Uh, Revelation chapter 5 verse 13 says, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, that's Jesus, be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. And so Jesus is worthy of equal worship to the Father. Uh, second, uh, because Jesus has defeated all the spiritual powers and forces of this world, that means the Colossians are now free from all the oppression of religious legalism and human tradition. And so it's really, it's really pointless for them trying to follow man-made rules and principles. And thirdly, uh, because they are now with Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God, that means they are in God's presence and they can enjoy God's presence forever. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, passage in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, that says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, the Colossians don't need to be lifted up into heaven with the angels since they have already been raised on high with Christ. They have everything they need. And so, so far, we've seen the significance for the Colossians that they have been raised and seated with Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He takes it even further in verse 3 when he says that their life is hidden with Christ in God. Their life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, if you can kind of cast your mind back, uh, in the letter of Colossians, Paul has already used the word hidden twice uh, in this letter. And each time he uses it, he means the same thing. So if you have a look there, chapter 1, verse 26, and chapter 2, verse 3, the idea of hidden, uh, when Paul uses it, it means something that is concealed or something that you can't see. So when Paul uses it in chapter 3, verse 3, he means the same thing. That is, your life and my life is concealed in Christ, or it, it can't be seen in Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still confused. Uh, what in the world does it mean that your life and my life is concealed in Christ? What does Paul mean by that? I'm not advocating for this book, but I'll just show it as an example. Uh, your Best Life Now, Seven Steps to Living at Your Full Potential. It's a book written by Joel Osteen. Now, I've not read the book, so I can't comment on what it teaches. But when I saw it, the very title of the book does make me ask a couple of key questions. And maybe you're asking the same question I am. The first thing I asked myself when I saw the title was, is it really possible for a Christian to live their best life here on earth? Is that how God had planned our life? And if it is possible to live my best life here on earth, what would that best life look like? And if I could live my best life here on earth now, then what else would I have to look forward to after I die? If this is the best that, of, of everything there is, then I don't want to leave this earth. This should be, what I, this is, should be where I want to stay. You see, the, the Jewish false teachers claim that the Colossians could, in fact, experience their best worship of God now that they could live their fullest life with Christ now, that they don't need to seek the things above where Christ is because they can have it right here and now. And all they need to do to have that is to keep doing all those religious practices. But Paul says that their best and fullest life with Christ is not 
and cannot be here and now. And that is because their perfect union with Christ is hidden with him in God. The Colossians' perfect union with Christ is a heavenly one. That explains why no one can physically see with their own eyes their perfect union with Christ because it's hidden with him above. This also explains why their earthly experience with Jesus is not all there is. And it also explains why our earthly experience with Jesus is often frustrating. Brothers and sisters, did you know that this life is not our glorious best? There is more to come. In fact, there is better to come. And so when will we get to experience this perfect union with Christ? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in verse 4, Paul answers that for us. He says in verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, friends, you can clearly see how this wonderful truth flies in the face of all those false teachers. You see, they were focusing all their attention on the believer's present and private relationship with God, thinking that this life was all there is. They claimed that the full establishment of God's kingdom could be here on earth. But, uh, but, but Paul says to think that way shows that their minds are stuck on earthly things. But Paul, on the other hand, emphasizes the future and the public second coming of Christ Jesus. When every believer from the Colossians to you and me today will share in that glory with Jesus for all eternity. And so the glory that these false teachers offered the Colossians was vain and empty. Uh, all their efforts to maintain religious perfection would count for nothing. But when Jesus returns, he will reveal the splendor and the majesty of his glory. And there is nothing that they can do to earn it except to eagerly wait for that day with faith. And so for you and me, instead of feeling down and disappointed about our current spiritual reality, Paul encourages us to set our hope rightly on Christ's return and the fulfillment of all things. Because the present reality of sharing with Christ's death resurrection and ascension actually anticipates the greater glory to come. But before I move on though, um, there is something else that Paul says in verse four that is really mind blowing and even confusing for some of us as well. But I wanna take some time to pick up on it real quick. Uh, there's verse four. You'll notice here in verse four, Paul also says, when Christ who is your life. Did you guys catch that? It says, when Christ, who is your life. Now, if you've been following me in this passage so far today, you'll notice that Paul has described our new position using the language of association, right? Meaning that our lives are forever united with Christ. But notice here in verse 4, Paul is not just saying that our life is with Christ. What does he say? He says, our life is Christ. I don't know if you guys watch MasterChef. I'm not a huge fan of MasterChef, but I think a new season just started. And uh, in the first few episodes, when all the contestants come together on MasterChef, um, the host of the show would ask each contestant, why are you here? Why did you sign up for the show? And each one of them answers. And all the answers are pretty much the same when you hear it. They all say, food is my life. And every time someone says that, what they mean is that they are so passionate about food that their whole life is about food. Um, they are consumed by their love for food. And so when you and me use that kind of language, we use it for all sorts of things, don't we? We say things like, photography is my life. Dogs are my life. My children are my life. TikTok is my life. Not my life, but you get the idea, right? It's just... When we say that term, what we mean is that we declare to everyone that my whole life is lived for that one thing. And so when Paul says Christ is our life, he's saying something similar. He's describing the very nature of a Christian's relationship with Jesus. 
in that we move from just association with Jesus to identification with Jesus. It's, it's not enough to simply say that our life is shared with Christ. That's true. But Paul also declares that our life is Christ, meaning that our life is consumed by Christ. Our whole life is lived for Christ. Our whole identity is tied up in Christ. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, friends, this is what it means to be a Christian. Your love, your identity, and your life is no longer yours, but it is Christ. Now, as you hear these words today, you may have come to realize that this is not true of you. Uh, this morning, maybe you like Christ. Maybe you know a lot of things about Christ, but you know that your life is not Christ. But can I just say that if you would like to make the decision today to have Christ as your life, then all you need to do is to put your faith in what he has done. And so far today, we have seen what Jesus has done in these verses. You see, by faith, believe that you have died to your sin with Christ, that you have been raised to new life with Christ, that you reign with Christ who is seated at the right hand of God, that your life is hidden with Christ in God, and that you will one day appear in glory with Christ when he returns. And so by faith alone, in Christ alone, this can be true for you if you make that decision today. And for those of us here who have made that decision already and your life is Christ, then I guess as we wrap everything up today, as we conclude this passage, what does all this mean? What do these four verses mean for you and me? Well, hopefully you've been following that uh, Paul has taken us on this amazing gospel journey with Jesus. By faith alone, our lives are forever united with Christ in his death, in his resurrection, his ascension, and his glorious second coming. But the question I asked at the very beginning, how does all this shape and change how we live? Well, Paul wonderfully answers that for us in verse 2. In verse 2, Paul says, set your minds on things that are above not on things that are on earth. Now, what's Paul saying here? Uh, is he telling you and me to think about heaven 24-7? I know it rhymes, but is it true? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that's what Paul's saying. Uh, so have to, think, have to ask yourself, what is the thing or rather the person who is above? As we've seen today, it's none other than the resurrected, ascended and seated Christ Jesus. He's the one who is above. Um, in sports language, you know when, um, when a coach tries to uh, push his team uh, to make them play their best and to play to win, he might say this very popular sports line, keep your eyes on the prize. You guys heard that before, right? Hear it all the time. Keep your eyes on the prize. What does he mean when he says that? Well, he's getting his team to fix their attention on winning. He wants them to focus their thoughts on the trophy because if their mind is set on winning the trophy, that will motivate them to perform at peak level. You see, setting their mind on the goal at the end shapes and changes how well they play now. Well, in the same way, setting our minds on Jesus shapes and changes how we live now. We've seen so far today that the gospel says that our lives are forever bound with Jesus. And that means Jesus characterizes and shapes how you and me live. I mean, just for a moment, think about the Lord's Prayer. We prayed every Sunday. In the Lord's Prayer, we are taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's Jesus saying? We're saying that as the kingdom of God reaches and extends into this world, then the beauty and the values of God's kingdom become more visible and more tangible here on earth where we live. And so a heavenly focus produces 
and earthly difference to our lives and to our world. And so setting our minds on Jesus does not mean removing ourselves from the things that are on earth. Rather, setting our minds on Jesus shapes the things that are on earth. You see, friends, Jesus shapes how we love our family, our friends and our neighbours. Jesus shapes our marriage and our parenting. Jesus shapes how we work and what we do with our money. Jesus shapes how we do church, evangelism and mission. Jesus even shapes our spiritual and moral life. He shapes everything. Because if our minds are set on Jesus, then all the things that are on earth are also set on Jesus. Now, what does that actually look like on a day-to-day level? Well, that's what Paul answers for us in next week's passage, starting in verse 5. And we're going to cover that over the next couple of weeks. But friends, for now, how about I pray for us as we close? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, we thank you so much for the great promise and great hope, God, that we read in these verses. Uh, Not only are we associated with Christ in his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his return, but our whole life is tied up in Christ and we find our life and our identity in him. For any of us here this morning, God, who have not made that decision, uh, Father God, we pray that you might uh, work in their hearts, make that clear. But for those of us who have, help us, God, to live in such a way that our mind is fixed on Jesus who is above in a way, God, that affects and changes everything we do here on earth. God, we ask for your, your help in this, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.